9.1 graphing quadratic functions. And if you've had a chance to explore this in something like GeoGebra or software, then you probably notice that if you just had a linear function that's normally in the form y equals mx plus b, then your lines are just straight lines. And you, of course, could rotate that, but it would still be a straight line. And that's because you have a linear term that is impacting the variable x, but then you also have some constant out here. The constant part is what moves it up and down, and the linear part is what gives it its either mild slope, dramatic slope, no slope at all, or negative slope. So we have a constant term, a linear term, but what is added on now is we, we now have a you know, parabolic part where it gives us this quadratic function. You know, that's where the x squared term comes in and it gives everything that different look. Now, in this little table that we have here, it's important to note that a does not equal zero. Because if it did equal zero, this would drop out and we wouldn't have a quadratic function at all. We just have a straight line uh, as a linear term. Later on, you'll find out that these are all based on a parent function. So I'm going to sketch this graph right now. And then on this graph, right at 0, 0, I'm going to draw a parabolic shape and label this as y equals x squared. So that would be just how it would behave in most situations. Now that's not always the case. So let's redraw two more sets of axes, keeping them neat enough for our purposes. And then we'll draw one where it opens upward, and then another where it opens downward. Now notice that in both of these, I'm on purpose making them not go through the origin. So let's tag these up with the word opens in front, and then here opens down. So that's what's going to happen. Now this is where our value of a would be positive, and this is where our value of a would be negative. Build a table of values to graph y equals 2x squared minus 4x minus 5. What are the domain and range of this function? Does the graph open upward or downward? Now, in these graphs, you know, this would probably be 5 over and this would be negative 5 over. And it's symmetric, but not at the center, not at the y-axis. So here it would be symmetric about this line. Well, this would be absolutely symmetric uh, with regards to the y-axis. So normally when we've graphed, we've always chosen values that go from negative 2 to negative 1, 0, 1, and 2 because that lets us know how it behaves close to the origin. But when we just look at these new problems, we have no idea whether if we start at negative 2 or not, we're going to get those values. So here let's make a uh, little note that says our goal. Whenever graphing these, you want to see symmetry because I want to know where these problems um, end up mirroring themselves. For this first set of notes, I've included a table for you, and uh, we need to build the table. I haven't even read all these directions. We're just going to stick to the order they tell us. And let's rewrite y equals, but where I see 2, I'll write 2, but where I see x, I'm going to open up parentheses, and I'm put negative 2 in parentheses, square it, subtract 4, times negative 2, minus 5, and I'm showing my work for this first one, and then I'd have 2 times a positive 4, plus 8, minus 5, and then 8 and 8 would give me 16, minus 5, and then 11. But now having done that, get your calculator out and type in this whole part with parentheses and everything, and then just go back and replace the 2 with the 1, get your value, then replace the whole thing with the 0, get your value, a positive one, and so on, so that you can fill in this table. So I've gone ahead and completed this, 
But what I dislike is that, now this is in red, you don't have to write this. This looks like it's 10 away from each other. This looks like it's 6 away from each other. 2, and then 2. So the next one would probably be 6 away from each other as well. But I'm not really seeing much repetition going on here. And because of that, I notice that these values are starting to mirror themselves. But I want to know a little bit more about how it behaves. So now let's add 3, and let's add 4 to the list, and uh, pause the video to go ahead and find the next values. And having found those next values, you'll hopefully notice that this is where it's centered, and then it kind of bounces, bounces, bounces. Okay, now let's talk more about what they're asking for next, and that's the domain and the range. Um, and we will graph this to help us see that. Grab a ruler and sketch a nice x and y axis, labeling it as a good habit. And then I'm going to realize something here. I'm like, well, it looks like I'm interested in something from negative 5 to 5. That will cover everything I need. And then when I put my tick marks here, I'll have a nice symmetrical graph. But then my y values go as high as 10. And the reason I say 10 and not 11 is because I think that if I sneak that 10th, that 11th one up there, it's within our range. So I've made my negative 10 down here, and then my negative 5, and then maybe 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 7, 8, 9. And this should be neat enough for our purposes. So I'm going back to 2 and then positive 11. Negative 1, 1, 0, negative 5, 1, negative 7, 2, negative 5. There's that part of the graph that I would have just seen if I graphed it um, only, only going up here. And that's not enough detail because I really want to see that symmetry. So now I'm back to 3, positive 1, and then 4, 11. And when I connect all these different points, my graph has that general shape. It looks like it's narrow. It looks like it's not super wide. And now let's picture, um, you know, what we would be using this for. Are we doing this to find any roots? Well, it doesn't say, you know, anything about finding the values where y would be zero. If it did, and I was graphing it for that purpose, I might want graph paper, or I might want to be a little bit more accurate. Um, so now let's look at domain. Now, when I look at this, maybe I picture the x values. And if I'm talking about all the possible x values, I want to scrunch my whole graph downward visually until I were to flatten it along this x-axis. Well, this point would end up here, this would end up here, and so on. And I think I would fill up everything on this x-axis if I just started scrunching it in, like a trash compactor or something. And even though it might not seem it, way, way, way out here, but very high up, I would actually have an incredibly negative possible x value. So as I look at the graph, I would say x can be anything, so it's all the real numbers. And let me show you how I drew that. It's basically an R with kind of a T connecting it, so it's a double struct R, and that means all the real numbers. It's X as the element, all the real numbers. No matter what, you can plug anything into this. Now, if I instead wanted to start to scrunch in the opposite direction, where I flattened everything to the Y axis, I would not have values down here. So I need to figure out what is the lowest y value I can have for my range. And when I look at that, I can't just say y is greater than, um, actually I can't, I'm sorry. I would say y is greater than or equal to, and then you'd look here if you wanted, find the lowest, that's your minimum, and you'd say negative 7. And then also check to make sure, well, you know, based on what I said here, can it be 10? Well, yeah, here's where y was 10. So you'd want to do a little sanity check on the uh, domain and range just to make sure you understood them. So hopefully the whole trash compactor example is kind of helpful. Does the graph open upward or downward? 
the graph opens upward. That's what this first one's going to be about anyway, but this will really describe all the uh, next ones. Uh, we'll just decide based on them. Label the vertex and the axis of symmetry. So here's some new terminology for you. Here's the vertex. The vertex is where x, y is equal to 1, negative 7. And then I want you to draw a dashed line going through those values with arrows at the top and bottom. And the reason we make a dashed line is so we don't confuse them with our x and y axes. And when I label the axis of symmetry, I would write y equals, I'm sorry, x equals, because it's dependent on x, positive 1. And then below all that work, even though it might seem excessive, write vertex 1 comma negative 7 with a colon after each point and axis of symmetry x is equal to 1. So that should uh, hopefully be kind of clear and it's nice to see all of the work summarized in one place because these problems get very, very, very multi-step before moving forward. Okay, so this is a little bit more... Um, Vacant, meaning there's not a table already set up for this. So use a table of values to graph y equals x squared plus 3. What are the domain and the range of this function? Does it open upward or downward? Label the vertex and axis of symmetry. So first, on the left side, let's set up your table. So hopefully this one works out nicely to where if I choose negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, that I'll be able to graph this and see the actual symmetrical shape of this. The other thing is once we do graph it we'll be able to answer most of these questions. I don't think this is too demanding to figure out. So negative 2 squared would be positive 4 plus 3 would be 7. Negative 1 squared would be 1 plus 3 is 4. 0 squared adds 3 and then I get 4 and 7. If you can't do that as quickly as I could, I'll get a calculator out and check it all out. Next, I have to answer what the domain and the range are of the function, and those are always helped by actually having a graph. So maybe about mid-center, I set up an x and y axis. You probably hear me turning the iPad. Always in the habit of labeling this x and y. Going from negative 5 to positive 5, just setting some reasonable boundaries for each of these. I would have chosen differently based on the value of my different quantities. And then I'm giving myself four tick marks as I go. Now I could give you graph paper and you can ask for that, but I really think that being able to graph and create these quickly is a good skill. And the more often you do it, the quicker you'll get at them. So I got negative two, positive seven, roughly up there. Negative one, positive four. Zero, three. Make these stand out a little bit more. Keep in mind, I'm using a more difficult uh, app than just doing this on paper. So when I look at this, I see some of the symmetry. And I make that kind of a quicker motion. You know, like this isn't like a circle. It's, it's more parabolic in nature. So you've got to get better at how you draw these um, and practice them. And then if I wanted to, I could label this graph because it's y equals x squared plus 3. And that's a nice organizational technique. So as I look at this, I can pretty much answer everything now. And we'll keep it in the order that they ask us. So let's list the domain, range, and then the upward, downward. Well, we can say it opens up. And then we're going to say the vertex. And then we're going to say the axis of symmetry. So the domain, um, let's check it out. Well, what x's can I plug in here that would always work out? Well, I don't see division by zero or anything going on. I can plug in negative one billion. So the domain would be like the one before, x is the element, and go ahead and repeat that to yourself, of all the real numbers. Later on, you might see domains written like this, from negative infinity to positive infinity, because that's what that means. 
It means it can be negative 1 trillion, it can be 0, it can be positive 1 trillion. There's no restrictions on the domain. But when I look at the range and I try to imagine this being scrunched on the y-axis, I don't have any graph going down here, so my graph would start at positive 3. So I would say y is greater than or equal to positive 3. And because of the way we chose points, this works out here as well. If I go on the vertex, I can label the vertex as that minimum value there. Now we are over 0, but we are up positive 3. And so I'll write that here as well, 0, comma 3. And then the axis of symmetry gets drawn. I'm going to draw mine as a red line, but I do want you to dash this because I want this to stand out. This would be going right along the y-axis. And the axis of symmetry is where the values x equals 0 are. And then if, if we wanted to, we could say y-axis. So the y-axis serves as the axis of symmetry in the same problem. Let's see. The equation y equals negative x squared plus 4x plus 3 represents the height y of a flying disk x seconds after it is tossed. Now, this is kind of a word problem, but really, it's no different at all. So you do this problem as an OYO problem, and I'm going to throw the answer up in about five seconds. And you may only want to choose 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 or something um, for the values that you test out. So, I have my table, and if I look at the table, I can see a maximum value of y. Same deal at this location. And I'm bringing that up because that means it opens downward, where I have a maximum value at my vertex of 2, comma 7. It's symmetrical at this point, too. That's where it repeats itself, where x is 2 where x is 2. And if you look at the domain and the range, you'll notice that, you know, I, I might have put something different than you did. And the reason I did is because, you know, really in the equation, x can be all the real numbers. But because we're dealing with time, for this particular problem, we're really just interested in after we throw uh, the, this flying disk. The other deal is, yeah, y would really be just less than or equal to 7, but it's not like this disk is going to go crashing through the ground at this point. So that's why I would restrict the range to being between here and here for y. Now I'm going to say a couple more things about this because these are important things for later problems. My graph is good, and good enough for our purposes. My graph would have to be neater if the problem was asking me, when does the disk hit the ground? If the disk was like hitting the ground and I wanted to figure out what that value of time would be, well, my graph might help me know that it's between 4 and 5 seconds. But the reason I'm pointing this out is that later on, when you graph different problems, you have to really wonder, what's the purpose? Like, why are we going to use this graph? And for this one, my graph was way, way accurate enough for me to answer all of these specifics about the problem. So hopefully these feel pretty comfortable. These are the first types of problems that you're going to be doing in 9.1 in this chapter about quadratic functions.